Gonorrhea, often referred to as the clap. This is the second most prevalent sexually transmitted infection in the United States. There are millions of new cases each year worldwide. So apparently, us humans like to participate in activities that can put us at risk for catching gonorrhea. So in today's video, we'll talk about how you can become infected, what are some of the symptoms, and two really concerning topics. One, can you have gonorrhea and not even know it? And two, Gonorrhea is actually getting harder and harder to treat, which is obviously concerning, so we're going to talk about why this is, and as a bonus at the end, we'll talk about some of the going theories as to why gonorrhea got nicknamed the clap. That was unintentional, but let's do this. Gonorrhea is most commonly a sexually transmitted infection caused by the bacterium Neisseria gonorrhea, sometimes pronounced Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, I mentioned most commonly sexually transmitted because there are some cases where this can be transmitted non-sexually, and I'll give an example of that later on in the video, but what are the signs and symptoms of the sexually transmitted form of gonorrhea? Well, let's start with how females are typically affected and then move on to how males are typically affected. And the most commonly infected structure in females is the cervix of the uterus here. Now, keep in mind, this is a sagittal cut through the midline, so like so. And again, here's that cervix of the uterus, then here's the body of the uterus, and even the vaginal canal here connecting to that cervix of the uterus. Now, when the cervix is infected with gonorrhea, what are those symptoms? What's crazy is up to 70% of cases are asymptomatic, which answers the question we asked earlier. You can be walking around with gonorrhea and not even know it, which means you could also spread it unknowingly. But when there are symptoms, those symptoms typically include vaginal irritation or even itching, vaginal discharge, or I should say abnormal vaginal discharge, and even intermenstrual bleeding, so bleeding between periods. Another commonly infected site in females is the urethra. Now the urethra, just like the infection of the cervix, can also be asymptomatic. But for the majority of the cases of when the urethra is infected, 90% of those cases also have infection of the cervix. But what would some of those symptoms be if they had them? Well, that could include things like dysuria, which is burning during urination, as well as urgency and frequency. So frequently feeling like you have to pee and kind of that urgency to get to the toilet. Now, a female could have all of the symptoms potentially. Dysuria, urgency, frequency, abnormal vaginal discharge, vaginal irritation, or they could have a subset of the symptoms. And the reason I bring this up is because some of these symptoms, especially when it's infection of the urethra, are pretty much the same symptoms you could get with a UTI, dysuria, urgency, and frequency. And so it's really important, say when like a female comes into the clinic, when I have female patients come in, for example, I will screen their risk for potential STIs for chlamydia gonorrhea infections when they have those UTI symptoms because it might not just be a regular old pathogen that causes a typical UTI. It could be a pathogen that's sexually transmitted. So how does gonorrhea affect males? Well, the most commonly infected site in males is the urethra. And although they can be asymptomatic, most of the STI clinic-based studies suggest that males are more likely to be symptomatic than females. Some of the studies suggesting that the majority of males will be symptomatic. And when they have those signs and symptoms, that would include things like urethral discharge. And it's described as this mucopurulent discharge. And you just break that term down, mucus for muco. Purulent refers to pus, so kind of this mixture of mucus and pus. Yes, our bodies produce some interesting substances, but they can also have something like dysuria, which we already went over is burning during urination. Now, sometimes the infection can move upward or what we'd call an ascending infection to move to structures that are higher upstream, if you will, and surrounding the testicle or testis specifically. And so right here, you can actually take a look at, here's a right testis, we're in the right side of the groin here, and specifically testis here, but the C-shaped structure here called the epididymis can be infected with gonorrhea. Now, the job of the epididymis is to essentially store sperm cells. So kind of think of this infection moving in the reverse direction that sperm cells would take to get outside the body. The gonorrhea moves in that opposite direction and can infect the epididymis. Now, what are some symptoms of that? That would be things like unilateral testicular pain, even testicular swelling. So we just mentioned that males can have this ascending infection that can affect upper reproductive structures. Females can also have an ascending infection, and it's typically associated with more complications, things like ectopic pregnancies and even infertility. And we'll talk some more details about that in just a second, 
But I want to go back to this discussion about asymptomatic cases or people having gonorrhea and not knowing it. This shows how important testing can be. Not only can testing confirm the diagnosis, help guide treatment, but it again can catch these asymptomatic cases and help reduce the risk of spread. Now, when we're talking about testing for gonorrhea, the best test is something called a nucleic acid amplification test, or NAAT. Nucleic acids are things like DNA and RNA, so this test is essentially detecting the genetic information of this pathogen, Neisseria gonorrhea. And we can get these specimens or these samples from, say, like the urine, or we can swab those infected structures that we talked about earlier in the video. Now, testing for sexually transmitted infections can come with some challenges. Maybe a patient is embarrassed or uncomfortable testing for an STI. Now, even though we try our best in a clinical setting to say, hey, we're here to help you, regardless of how you got here, creating a non-judgmental safe environment, even then, sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea are underreported and even under-tested, if you will. And that's why I'm excited for other options and the sponsor of today's video, Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked provides private, convenient testing in the comfort of your own home. They have multiple tests to choose from, routine blood work, to hormone testing, and yes, tests for sexually transmitted infections, including gonorrhea. So if you wanted to get tested, all you'd have to do is go online, order the test you want, and they'll ship it to your house where you can gather the specimen and ship it back with their prepaid label. They even have medical staff on hand that can go over any positive results and any potential treatment options. And again, I think we can all agree that testing for something like gonorrhea is important for potential treatment and reducing the spread because if anyone were to test positive, they can get treated. It would also be wise to notify any of their recent sex partners. So if you're interested in getting tested, go to trylgc.com slash IHASTI and they'll give our audience 30% off any of their tests if you use our coupon code IHA30. The link is in the description below. So let's go back to this discussion about the complications that I mentioned with females getting gonorrhea and then we'll go into this discussion why treatment options for gonorrhea are getting more concerning. Now remember, this ascending infection can cause complications in females. And if we go back to the cadaver dissection, that common in infection site was the cervix of the uterus. And if it moves up, it will move deeper into the body of the uterus and even into the structure here called the uterine tube. Hopefully you can see that embedded in the tissue at the tip of the probe and even the ovary that you can see right here. Now FYI, that uterine tube is also known as the fallopian tube. But as that infection moves upward, it can inflame those structures and it can cause something called pelvic inflammatory disease. Now what's crazy about this again is that many of the female cases are asymptomatic and sometimes they don't even find out that they have gonorrhea until weeks or months down the road till this pelvic inflammatory disease develops. About 10 to 20 percent of untreated gonorrhea cases will develop into this pelvic inflammatory disease and some of the symptoms that occur with this are lower abdominal or pelvic pain, uh, abnormal uh, bleeding, so again, bleeding between periods and things like that. And then also you can get something called dyspareunia, which is a fancy pants name for pain during intercourse. Now, one of the other complications, or I should say two complications that we mentioned earlier, is if this inflammation in the fallopian tube or the uterine tube persists, it can cause scarring in there and one that can cause infertility because it makes it hard for the sperm cells to pass from that through that scar tissue to fertilize an egg that was produced by the ovary. Also what can happen, let's say a sperm cell did squeeze by the scar tissue, fertilize an egg up in the upper fallopian tube, but what could happen is that uh, now fertilized egg, it's supposed to descend and implant in the uterus, but that fertilized egg while it's trying to descend might get stuck in the scar tissue and implant in the uterine or fallopian tube, and we call that an ectopic pregnancy, and those are no joke. We like to get those treated and taken care of ASAP. So as you can see, these potential complications of pelvic inflammatory disease gives us another reason as to why early testing, early detection, and prompt treatment is so important. Now, the current first-line treatment for gonorrhea is an antibiotic called ceftriaxone, also known by a brand name, Rocephin. Now this is an intramuscular injection of 500 milligrams. Intramuscular means it's just being injected into the muscles. Typically it's into the gluteal musculature. Now I have implied throughout the video that there are some concerns around the treatment of gonorrhea. And let me just give you an example from my experience since I've been practicing medicine. When I first started, 
the recommended dose was 250 milligrams of ceftriaxone. But now that recommendation has been increased to 500 milligrams. Now, why would that be? Well, this pesky little bacterium, Neisseria gonorrhoeae, is developing resistance to this antibiotic. And that's just from my experience of practicing medicine. If we go all the way back to say like the 1940s, there used to be multiple antibiotics that could work on gonorrhea. But as time has gone on, as the infection has spread from person to person to person, it has developed more and more resistance to multiple antibiotics, even to the current first line treatment, ceftriaxone, by needing an increased dose. Now, I'm not here to try to scare anybody, but there is data and concern that there eventually, if this continues, could be strains that are completely resistant to ceftriaxone and potentially untreatable, which again, can be kind of concerning. And I do sound like a broken record here, but again, that's why it's so important to have safe sex practices, early detection, early testing, and potential treatment. Because the more the bacteria is exposed to multiple hosts and spread from person to person and exposed to antibiotic after antibiotic, the more likely it is to develop resistance. And a quick little FYI, often when we treat people for gonorrhea, we'll also treat them for chlamydia. And the reason for that is there are plenty of cases where people can have both gonorrhea and chlamydia. They're spread in very similar ways and they have crossover in some of their symptoms. Now, if you have a confirmed test that says they're positive for gonorrhea but negative for chlamydia, you can avoid treating for both. But like I said, there are plenty of cases where you will be adding another antibiotic to treat for chlamydia and that antibiotic is called doxycycline. Now, we have a couple other things to do. One, we have to talk about that nickname, the clap, some of the theories of where that came from. And two, are there other potential sites of infection outside of genital structure, so extra genital infections? And the answer to that is yes. And one of those sites is the anus and the rectum. And you can see that here on this particular cadaver. And the greatest risk for developing an infection in this region is males who have intercourse with males and others that participate in receptive intercourse in this area. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to spread through intercourse in that area. You can also get it based on the proximity of the vaginal canal to the anus. You can see how close those are and the bacteria could just potentially move into that region. Now, again, infection of gonorrhea in the anus and the rectum can be asymptomatic, but when it does have symptoms, it can have anal rectal pain, anal rectal bleeding, even that mucopurulent drainage, and even this, feelness, uh, this feeling of fullness, like you have to go to the bathroom, but nothing's actually there. Another site that you can have gonorrhea that's outside the genital structures is the pharynx. And pharynx is a fancy pants name for the word throat. And I think it's somewhat obvious how you could get gonorrhea in that region by having intercourse that would get secretions there. So one of the things that we can again have is asymptomatic, but also when they do have symptoms, or I should say if they do have symptoms, those would include things like sore throat, even swollen lymph nodes in the neck or cervical lymph nodes, and you can even get pus in the throat. And the last location I want to mention is the outer clear protective covering of the eye called the conjunctiva. Now this generally is not transmitted sexually. It's most commonly transmitted as baby passes through the birth canal of an infected mother and it causes a form a, of pink eye, like a gonorrhea form of pink eye, which is redness of the eye and discharge. And this is treated with the use of antibiotic drops. And finally, what are some of the going theories as to where this nickname, the clap, came from? We'll talk about three. And the first one is from this French word clapier. Now, I apologize if I didn't pronounce clapier right, but this word refers to a brothel. And the idea is that someone at a brothel is more likely to contract an STI like gonorrhea. The second comes from a potential treatment option. I should say an old school treatment option, kind of this medieval treatment, is to take two heavy objects, place the penis in between, and clap the penis with these heavy objects in order to express the pus outward and therefore potentially express the infection out. It didn't work and there's all sorts of potential problems with that in my mind, but let's move on to the third. The third is from this word called clappen. Clappen is this old English word that means to beat or to throb and this idea was that it would resemble the potential pain from a gonorrhea infection. So those are three potential going theories. Why don't you guys comment below which one's your favorite and we'll have fun discussing why it's your favorite and 
Some of you are going to be sadistic and probably pick the second one. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hopefully, you learned some new and interesting information. If you're interested in testing, be sure to check out the link in the description below for Let's Get Checked. And if you feel the need, like, subscribe, continue to blow up our comment section. And if you choose to participate in Coitus before our next video, please do so safely, responsibly, and consensually.